There are many words that are thrown around that most people fuzzily blend together. And I'd like to try to define them. Reality, cosmos, universe, multi-universe, uh, the physical world, the world that may embed consciousness or supernatural or godlike uh, existence. Uh, how can we define these terms so we have a clearer understanding? Well, possibly the word reality is easiest. Reality is everything which is, in fact, the case. And that would include all facts about possibilities. I think that reality is obviously infinitely rich because it includes infinitely many facts about possibilities. Facts that certain things could come into existence without committing any logical contradiction so that they wouldn't be like married bachelors or like people who have two heads but who only have one head. <laughs> There's a, a hugely rich and complicated uh, set of facts of that sort, which is infinitely large, and that's part of reality. I wouldn't want to confine myself talking about reality to just the world of, of actual things, objects. I'd want it to be much wider. So you would have reality including not just existence, whether there's consciousness or God would be part of that existence, but reality involves possibilities. Since they really are possible, yes. And may in fact occur at different, but even as possibilities. Even as possibilities, they are obviously infinitely rich, so it's a trivial fact that reality is infinitely rich. Okay, yeah. okay. so that's reality. Mm -hmm. Now let's deal with cosmos. As soon as you get to cosmos, you could have different definitions, and I think that one of the things which makes philosophers like me real painful types to deal with is that they plump for one definition and say, nobody must use any other definition. And this is just stupid, because people aren't going to take dictation. There's all sorts of reasons for using different definitions. Uh, I would prefer to talk about the physical cosmos, that's to say, everything which is run by the laws of physics, and a possibly greater cosmos which might include God or might include immaterial angels for all I can prove. Okay, I'd be willing to use the word cosmos slightly more widely. So you might have a cosmos, you know, sub-zero, which is the which is the physical everything in the physical universe, and then a cosmos prime if you will, which would embed a yep. spiritual or other planes of existence, so to speak. Well, one way would be to say there's the cosmos and inside it is the physical cosmos. Uh -huh. And maybe the, the cosmos outside the physical cosmos is all a bunch of fictions. Maybe there is yeah. no God, no, maybe there are no immaterial angels and so on. So the subset of the physical cosmos would be the equivalent of the, the superset, but we don't know that. We don't know that. It, it, it could be that anything outside is just fictitious. Good. And, and now let's go to the next step is universe, which is a term that most people use for everything. Uh, yeah, but this is a dreadful term because it can mean all sorts of different things. At the end of my book, um, Modern Cosmology and Philosophy, an edited book of readings, I felt I had to produce a glossary and that there had to be a definition of universe among other things. And I had a lot of fun with that because I came up with about 12 different definitions, <laughs> all of them conflicting. Uh, by universe, you might mean absolutely everything, including God. Or you could, might mean the physical cosmos we've just been talking about. Or you might mean everything which we can directly know about because we could have interacted with it. And this would be, according to the Big Bang theory, everything within the radius from which light could have come to us since the start of the Big Bang. It would, however, seem a little bit um, arbitrary to say that things beyond that were not part of the cosmos just because we hadn't seen them yet. If we were going to see them in the next five seconds, <laughs> sorry, it wouldn't be part of our universe. Yeah. Uh, if we were going to see them in the next five seconds, we'd probably like to have them in there. Uh, some excuses for calling a, a, a thing a separate universe is you think there are lots of other things li like it, but they are different in their characteristics. Well, just how much different do they have to be before they count as separate universes? Uh, is it important that there wouldn't be some un underlying space in which they all exist? Will you talk about separate universes if you think of them all as completely 
separately coming into existence, no underlying background space. I don't really care very much. Uh, does a universe have to be very large? Well, what about Stephen Hawking's book, Black Holes and Baby Universes, which talks about universes which are much too small to see, which uh, produced in vast numbers, perhaps, but then recollapse within uh, much less than a microsecond. Should they count as universes? Because they might have grown bigger. They're the sort of thing which do grow bigger. If they'd been expanding slightly faster, they would have grown bigger and lasted for billions of years. But actually, they only got to be some tiny fraction of a, a centimeter and collapsed in some tiny fraction of a second. Does that mean we can't call them universes? Again, I don't very much care. That word can move around very fluidly, and I'm quite happy with that. And now we have this new term, multiverse or multi-universe. Because uh, people are more and more inclined to think that the physical cosmos will have in it many different regions which aren't connected to each other by light rays or not connected yet, and which have different characteristics, um, they talk in the West of a multiverse. In, um, in Russia, they tend to talk about our metagalaxy and contrast it with other metagalaxies. So everything which we can be aware of is this metagalaxy, but maybe there's a metagalaxy down the road which uh, we'll never get to know about by direct contact. Okay, we have this possibility of a vast number of universes and a multiverse, and even greater than that, the definition of reality embedding all logical possibilities. With this enormity and this expansion of what our concept is as a philosopher, what does that make you think? It makes me depressed thinking of all the work which a philosopher would have to do in order to bring clarity to the definitions in this entire field. <laughs> and I'm very happy to leave that work to other people. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but what do you, what is your, your heart tell you? What is, when you see this as a trained philosopher, but seeing the, the perfusion of the growth of reality, even beyond exponential growth, what, how do you interpret that? How does it, what, what does your instinct tell you? Well, my instinct tells me that um, previously people had been very narrow-minded in how far they thought reality could stretch. And now, interestingly, they're being pushed out of this narrow-minded mood by discoveries in, in physics and by people who in the field of philosophy say such things as, look, you've got to take possibilities seriously. Possibilities, they, they may not be real things, but they are real possibilities, and you cannot understand talking about the world unless you take into account real possibilities. Just one trivial example. Um, you throw a brick at a window, and you say that the brick caused the window to shatter. What you mean, among other things, is that in the possible situation in which the brick had not been thrown at the window, the window would have remained intact. <laughs> <laughs> and you couldn't understand the basic concept of causation, one thing causing another, unless you took the notion of that possibility seriously, which is what people are now doing. Which, in a sense, is an alternative reality. Possibility, in this case, is how reality might have been, but isn't in fact. Unless you take the view of David Lewis, who is an extremely brilliant philosopher, who thought that all possibilities were real somewhere. They weren't all in our universe, but they were elsewhere. Somewhere, even the Greek gods were reigning, because there was, as he said, there's nothing in the notion of a god which makes it a god satisfy some inconsistent description. That's to say, a god is not like somebody who has two heads and only one at least if he's one of the Greek gods. <laughs>